Good morning, everybody. Welcome to See the Futures. We have a great show today. We're going to be talking about the yield curve. We're going to be talking about treasuries. We're going to be talking about inflation. We do have Jimmy Iorio here today, TJM Institutional Services, world famous Futures Edge podcast, frequent contributor to the CME and all, all sorts of news outlets and a great overall guy. But before we get too far along, let me remind everybody. Trading futures, options, and futures involve substantial risk of loss, not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although that could be an equation for opportunity, which I think is why we're all here, it's also uh, an equation for risk. So be careful. Only fund your futures uh, uh, futures trading uh, account with risk capital. My personal definition, money I could afford to lose, doesn't change my lifestyle, doesn't lengthen my retirement horizon, and doesn't overly stress me out. Stress is a big deal, folks. In life, in general, we make bad decisions. So be in a good spot. And remember, micros are your friends as well. Having said all that, let's welcome Jimmy aboard. Jimmy, good to see you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me again. You know, back to back. You know, last week I couldn't get enough and we needed more information. So I said, <laughs> forget Bob. We're going to push him off a week. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, forget Bob. It's all about us. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, this is a perfect topic for what's going on today. We have, you know, interest rates on the move. We have Treasuries on the move. We have yields on the move. Inflation is all over the place. I have a, I have the micro uh, yield products up on the screen as we speak. So this like you to underscore what you just said. And I hate to even sound over dramatic or hyperbolic, but this is absolutely fascinating. What's going on? And I it clearly nothing I've seen in my career to date. The yield curve just inverted today, twos to tens. And twos to tens, I think, is the best measure because two-year encompasses what the Fed's doing on the short end and the 10 years far, far enough away to see what the, what the market feels of long-end bonds are somewhat independent of the Fed, particularly now. I know this is one of the first times we've been independent of the Fed. But this is, since it's gone negative, it's you know, about 85% accuracy rate over the last 100 years of predicting the next inflation, uh, recession. I think that is within the next quarter is according to the Bloomberg historical model. Speaking of Bloomberg uh, historical model, they now predict almost 40% chance of a recession. Um, the Atlanta Fed GDP now model is predicting the next, uh, predicting GDP to be negative 2.1%. So they're essentially saying that we're in a recession already. And at the whole time, the Fed keeps talking about tightening. The market still predicts the Fed's going to tighten. So the Fed is actually tightening into a slowdown potentially tightening into a recession, which I've never seen before. It's pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with you. And I've been around a long time. And this is a unique, <laughs> a unique marketplace across all the asset classes. But it's a tightrope that the Fed's really walking. And we have QT too. Remember, quantitative tightening is going on as well. And that game plan has been laid out in detail. So that's going to continue. Right, which is funny because QT, if it's, if it's, we really believed in it. We believed they'd be selling bonds. And so 10-year yields should be going up. They're not, as we've seen. So obviously, the market forces that are buying bonds are bigger. And again, what we've said historically about why the inversion, and I know some people who are listening know this, but when twos to tens inverts, what it generally means is that the money that's out there, the investment dollars out there, looks around for what to invest in. They can't come up with, come up with anything because they feel that the dark clouds are gathering. So they buy long-end U.S. Treasury bonds, and that drives that yield lower than the front end. And that's what we're seeing right now. And it, like we said, it's a pretty good predictor of, um, of what's come. I personally believe that we are in a recession right now. Um, that GDP Fed now number, it's been around since 2011. It's never been more than two full percentage points off what the actual GDP number comes out at. It, actually, one time it was, it was in Q1 of 2020, when it predicted negative 35 percent GDP, and the number came in as negative 32 percent GDP. So on a relative basis, that doesn't seem to really matter that much. So if you did take that one away and call it the aberration, it's never been more than two percentage points off, which means we are negative GDP right now. Yeah, it, I feel it. You know, it feels like we are anyway in real life. J just so everybody knows, though, when we say inv inverted, when you say the two is inverted from the 10, that means that the yield is higher on the two than it is on the 10, which is unusual. Right. Yeah, I should have I should have plugged that part in. Right, exactly. So that's why that buying in the long end forces down the 10 year relative to the two year. So right now we're, we're inverted by what? About two, about uh, two basis points, right? Yeah. 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 So Pretty that's amazing. interesting. 
So, you know, the, the, it's funny because we're most of us here on the niche trader side, we, we're, we have a day trading point of view, a day trading uh, idea. And the volatility on a day to day basis is uh, since Thanksgiving really has been outstanding, not only on the outrights, right? The treasuries, 10 year, 30 year, two year, five year, all the way down the Fed funds, but also in, on the markets we're looking at right now, the, the new micro yields. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. And this is what I really love about the micro yields. And I do some work on uh, CME Active Trader for this right now. So if you are just new to trading the yield curve or looking at the yield curve, and you look at it now and you think to yourself, you know, the last time it inverted, um, it went down to negative 40 basis points. I can't remember exactly when that was. I was just looking at the chart I have in my head. But if you were a trader who believed that we were going to revisit that level of negative 40 base points. Right now, it's trading about negative two base points. These, the yield contracts, instead of with the old contracts, the, um, you know, the two-year futures versus the 10-year futures, you'd have to do a calculation, a, a, a ratio thing based on volatility, based on size of the underlying contracts. And these, the micro yield contracts, have been um, formulated to make it much easier. So if you, want, if you believe we're going to negative 40, you would just buy the two-year, I believe it's trading approximately about 2.8, sell the 10-year, which is trading approximately 2.78. That's the two basis points we talked about. And if you had that trade on in the micros and it goes down to negative 40 basis points, you make $380. You make $10 a tick. You sold it at negative two. If you bought it back at negative 40, you make uh, 380 bucks. It's, it's a pretty simple uh, tool. And that's what I really like about it. And that's, what's, that's what they designed it for. And I think they really hit a home run. Yeah. And so for, from a spread trade point of view, I think is what Jimmy's talking about. Uh, you know, you, you want to, you're going to have, you're going to be long and short, right? You're going to be young, yeah. long and short. You think that this, this, the difference between the two are going to change in a certain manner, either a flat and continue, a continue uh, kind of getting normal or a unnormal yield curve. And then hopefully you may, you, you know, you profit more on one side, then you lose on the other side. Right. And, and what I was saying, I guess I hate when, you said what I think Jimmy's talking about. That means I talk too fast and I went too deep in the woods <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll back up a little bit too. <laughs> so that's, those are the words I hate to hear. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is if you think the 10-year yields are going to go further below the two-year yields, that's why you'd put this trade on. And what and really the fundamental part of this, and as I've said on this podcast before and, the, and people have heard me say it many times, I'm about 65% of a follower of price, a technical trader, but I like fundamental analysis to kind of buttress my viewpoint. And this one is very interesting fundamental analysis because what I'm saying, if I think the yield curve is going to go down to negative 40 basis points, what I'm saying is, is that the Fed is not going to back off their tightening of the Fed funds rate anytime in the next few weeks, even as the storm clouds of recession start to gather. So those two-year yields could potentially move higher still, although they've come down um, you know, quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. But if the Fed still sticks with their aggressiveness, they will stay the same or go higher, where at the same time, there'll be a flight to quality bid in the 10-year, which could force those yields materially lower. Does that make sense now? Yeah, it totally makes sense. I'm going to pull up, and I love this I love this Fed fund probability tool. I'm going to just show, show it to you. I'm going to pull it up on my screen right now, which kind of predicts, you know, I don't know what the details of the analytical model they use, but they're basing it on the Fed fund's futures. And then right. they show kind of meet, you know, the next meeting here is in 21 days. It's July 27th. And it says, hey, we have a 90% chance we're going to have a 75 basis point hike. And yep. um, that's been yep. pretty consistent over the last week or so. Right. And but what's interesting is though that stayed consistent, what's changed a little bit is what the terminal rate's going to be a year from now, let's say July of 2023. And now the market believes that the terminal rate will be between 3% and three and a quarter percent, where even as much as um, you know, three weeks ago, we believed that that was going to be 50 basis points higher. Well, really about 37 and a half basis points higher was going to be uh, significantly higher than it was. So what the market is saying, which actually fits right into the curve trade we're saying, is that the, C, the, the market believes that the Fed is going to front, lay, front load these uh, rate hikes. And they've said nothing to dispel that belief up to this point. But then they're going to have to stop quicker than they anticipated. I still think they're going to have to stop quicker than that even suggests because remember, we have, mark it on your calendars, people, July 13th is that next CPI number. I have been vocal about the fact that I believe inflation has peaked. I can back it up with some statistics. Five-year break-evens just since the last CPI number on June 10th 
have gone from 3.2 down to 2.6 or 7-ish. Copper's down 30%. Even oil just gets uh, crushed yesterday. So the commodity complex has uh, tipped over. Now, the thing that goes against my argument that, and Jim, just give me the nod or something if I'm talking too much and putting people to sleep. The thing that goes against my argument is the fact that the CPI does a really poor job of showing rents and rents equivalents. The last one underestimated it at 5.5%, even though it makes up 33% of the CPI. The next one has the potential to overestimate it as it all plays catch up. So here's what I worry about. Here's the ultimate worry is that because of the lag effect of rents and rents equivalents, CPI will remain high, the headline will. The Fed will see that headline, respond to political pressures, despite the fact that everything else within that CPI appears to be crumbling and heading lower. And they will still maintain their hiking course, despite the fact that markets are probably signaling to them that they should not. Yeah, so <laughs> you'll never, we'll accuse you of some things. We'll never accuse you of putting anybody to sleep. Just let's start with that. Okay, okay, good. Yes. Uh, no, no, it's all good. So, yeah, so I just put this back up here, this, this probability sheet. This is dynamic. It changes over time, right? And it gives traders kind of a clue. If you look at it every day, you kind of get a mental memory of kind of how the probabilities are changing over time. It's probably more, it's probably more accurate in the short term than it is the long term, but it does change, right? It's dynamic. So like, I think I agree with you. If CPI comes in totally wacky, this is going to change. Wacky either up or down, right? This is going to change. Oh, yeah. It's going to look differently for sure. It's not, it's not written in stone. This is the, this is the answer. Well, yeah, and to underscore that point, too, is, you know, as it gets closer to the expiration of those particular Fed funds futures contracts and gets closer and closer to the meeting, the odds of it being right obviously go up exponentially. When we move out a year, like, just think about the Fed and the Fed's dot plot. Like, they change that all the time, and they're supposed to. Nobody's supposed to set a course and then not alter it, even though the facts may alter over the next year. So I have often thought that the market places too much um, emphasis on the transparency of the Fed beyond the next meeting or two, because the Fed doesn't know what they're doing. And that's not even a knock on the Fed. Just it's a dynamic situation we're in and things change rapidly. If you don't see how things change rapidly, just rewind the tape back to that June 10th number that came in 8.6 in the CPI. A week before that, we were pricing in a quarter point basis point move at the meeting, um, the, at the next meeting. And then we quickly revamped that, well, the July meeting. We quickly change that to a 75 basis point of the meeting. So, I mean, things change really, really quickly around here. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. But it's a great tool. I mean, they, they have a lot of great tools. As a matter of fact, I'm going to throw another one up real quick. I'm going to throw their quick strike treasury. Uh, treasury, uh, I don't want, I don't know what you want. It's, this is the treasury yield curve, right? This is the right. futures treasury yield curve. There's all sorts of other categories on the left-hand side of this chart. You can get this in the CME group. It's really nice, but it kind of gives you a general picture, right? We want to see a yield curve in a normal environment where it's on the low side, it's the lowest, it's the lowest interest rate or yield. And then it, it, it slopes upward gradually. Here you see this middle part is a little bit depressed. And that's, that's when they talk about uh, uh, inverted. Right. And, and the thing that really strikes me in this, it's the two year, it's the one that the Fed funds, that the Fed and the Fed funds rate is giving implications for, the one is most controlled by the Fed is the outlier here. Well, I, obviously there's other slope downward too, but it slopes from that, that two year level. So like you said, all those are supposed to be in a normal shape curve. So starting from two year, everything shoots straight down, which is highly unusual. And I will even add again, because it deserves to be said twice, really unusual when the Fed's still in a tightening cycle and shows no signs of abating. Yeah, I mean, especially, you know, the two years over three and then you have the 10 year, you know, way under three. It's just crazy. Certainly crazy. Yeah, I, I haven't seen something like this in a long time. And this I don't know if you want to talk about you know, micro equities as well in here, because I think that there's implications for both, obviously. Um, you know, I think if the Fed, if the market thinks that the Fed's going to over tighten and tighten us into a recession, which I, I personally think that's a done deal. So the next question is tighten us into what depth of recession, then obviously it's going to have implications for equity markets as well. I personally think that we're going to see one uh, significant leg lower in the stocks. And then 11 out of the last 17 times that the stock market has had greater than a 15% move lower, 11 out of those 17 times, it hasn't bottomed until the Fed has signaled um, a move from hawkishness to either neutrality or dovishness. 
And I think that that move is going to happen relatively quickly. So I'm not that scared about the stock market having some sort of monumental um, collapse. I think that it has going to be one more push lower, make it the S&P down 25, 26%, which would be new lows. But then I think once the Fed starts signaling that they could be done, I think that gains its footing. Very interesting. That's about a 66% chance. My, my math might be a little off, but it's 11 out of 17, close enough uh, based yeah. on that stat. Yeah, that's pretty interesting for sure. Gets you into the <laughs> Hall of Fame in Major League Baseball, right? <laughs> Absolutely, for <laughs> sure. But you know, on that, a continuation of that point, you know, now there's there hasn't been for a long time, but now jobless claims are starting to co- come into effect. And the weird thing is, we kind of want jobless claims to be bad to signal a slowdown to taper inflation kind of naturally in the marketplace. Right. And that's one of the reasons I thought, and again, you make an interesting point, is that the jobs picture is only starting to slow where other things have slowed, or have slowed down quite a bit. But the things that bring us into recession are the same things that bring demand down, which demand is the side of the equation, a significant side of the equation that was pushing that inflation. The Fed interest rates are part of it. The fact that your equities, uh, so much money has been drawn out of equities, um, and so much money has been drawn out of crypto. I believe we've lost like $5 trillion of liquidity has been taken out of the market by asset prices correcting. These are big deals. The supply chain might actually be healing a little bit too. There are some signals that there was in the Empire Fed and the Philly Fed said that um, supplier delivery times were coming lower, which is, is a big deal about that the supply side of inflation. But as you mentioned, the jobs picture hasn't um, come down yet. But if it does, that deals a blow to the inflation. And again, the Fed is singularly in fo- focused on inflation this year. Last year, they were singularly focused on job growth, singularly uh, focused on inflation, and they are not going to stop until they're convinced that inflation is lower. And they've said, or implied at least, that they were willing to risk a recession, which I think they're realizing that risk. Yeah, you know, the funny part, I mean, this is a regional observation, but down here in Charleston, there's not, a, there's not a store, a shop, a restaurant that does not have a we're hiring sign on it. I mean, it's, right. there, it's, it, there's a labor thing going on as well. What a crazy time for that labor thing. And again, I'm in the restaurant business, Brants of Palatine, Palatine, Illinois. Um, and I'm sorry about the plug. But we, <laughs> my, my fellow friends in the restaurant business were having an extremely difficult time. And I have spent many nights trying to figure out the macroeconomic implications and why there's a labor shortage. And you can you can spot a couple different things. One, uh, we're not getting, we did not get the same immigration that we normally do over the last two years, perhaps as shy as many as 1.5 million immigrants. The, over the last two years, we've had a huge, huge uptick in the amount of people retiring, baby boomers just leaving the workforce. That could have been as much as 3 million additional employees just left the workforce because people these, this is the kind of times that change people and change what people believe and what people see as their future. And I think people thought the hell with it. If I, I mean, if I have enough money to retire now, why am I going to keep you know, staying in this fight um, if everything can change in an instant? Now, I'm curious to see how the move lower in asset prices will change that macroeconomic factor and see if it can draw people back in, into the labor market who thought they were going to be gone. And it's not, everybody thinks of it in terms as, well, the stock market's going up. Yeah, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to retire. And then you retire for a couple months. If the stock market goes back below where that started, that doesn't mean you're jumping back in. It takes a bigger push to, to do, this is a glacial movement when you're talking about the entire labor market. I hope that makes sense. I feel like I'm ranting a little bit. The coffee's kicking in big. Yeah, and then look what happened to crude oil yesterday. What was that all about? Fourteen handle move down on crude oil. Um, yeah. I don't have that. Ch- I don't have that chart up right now, but it was. Uh, I could put it up pretty easily. Yeah, um, but no. What you was... have up there is, is the euro, which, by the way, the euro and crude oil happened to, to cascade in the same day, and I think that that move is related. Um, you know, the euro I'll, is is I'll put deep. It back. here. Let's see. It. Yeah, I'm gonna put it back. I'm gonna put it back. Yeah, no. Look at that euro breaking through significant support. Um, I think that what they're saying here is that, remember, so the Fed, the Bank of Canada were both really, really serious about addressing inflation and they started hiking rates. The ECB for months and months and months has been reluctant because they are suffering disproportionately the economic slowdown from things that they import from Russia being much more expensive. So now also in the last two readings of that Eurostat says Europeans are spending less on food and drinks, despite the fact that those same food and drinks are higher costs. And now all of a sudden we, we project a couple months 
in advance and winter's coming and there could easily be energy shortages. So I think if you look at the Eurozone, it's not unreasonable to start think they might be adding liquidity instead of pulling liquidity away, even in times of this huge inflation. Any thoughts on that, Jim? Yeah, no, I agree 100%. As John Snow would say, winter is coming. I know it sounds weird to say that right now. It's like July, right? We're at the peak of summer yeah. and everyone is uh, at the beach or the pool. But um, yeah, that's a, it's a real, it's problematic. And I think uh, it's problematic uh, not only for the euro, but for inflation in the eurozone, right? Because at the end of the day, energy is, we need energy for everything, right? Even oh, yeah. to make our clothes, to drive our cars, to, you know, to, to, to buy, uh, you know, durable goods, non-durable goods. It's, it's the baseline of stuff we need. And um, I know it's a natural gas kind of market over there in Europe, but it's going to, it's a problem, it's more problematic from them, from, from the Europeans than it is in the U.S. from my point of view. I think production on crude, I think is, is pretty, is up a lot here in the U.S. I don't have the exact stat. They're talking about it on Bloomberg this morning. Um, I think we have a better capacity to generate uh, in times of uh, in times of trouble, and I think that's what that's the difference between the two. And we'll see the difference in the in the currencies as we approach parity in the euro. Yeah, how about that? First time in twenty years, yep, there hasn't been parity since I think um, the year to, the year two thousand. Correct? It just yeah, amazes I, I, me. I, 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 yeah, we're this it's, is we're time way... to plan your Italy vacation, people. Right? Exactly, for sure. And if you're going, <laughs> let me know. I'll go with you. <laughs> right. So it's got some no, work to do. It's got some work to do. But yeah, no. Yeah, yeah me either. I, so I was pre-COVID last time I went. So Yeah, same with me. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll get there one of these days as well. But it's funny how they're all related. And, you know, when I saw that crude oil chart yesterday, um, and then I kind of went back and looked at commitment of traders. Uh, John Kemp from Reuters helped me out with that a little bit. And it was, uh, it was interesting to see even the institutions now are starting to taper on their long positions. Yeah, no, it, it's it's unbelievable. And I think what Crude was telling us yesterday with that big move was that they 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 plan on a global recession, not just recession here. Now, the move higher in the dollar is fascinating, too, is that I think it was kind of a global panic and the dollar still. Remember, the dollar index is 70 percent the yen and the euro. So it's not unreasonable to think that in any times of global stress, when you look at the three big central banks and you have to ask yourself which one's being the most responsible out of the three, we are a clear winner on a relative basis, considering that Japan is still pegging 0.25 on their tenure and they're willing to sell as much of their currency as they have to to do it, correct? Yeah, no, for sure. And then just, I'm going to pull up a Japanese yen chart. I mean, this is the most amazing thing of all time. I mean, oopsie, let's see. That's six. Sorry, 6J. Let's get that cooking on here. You know, we fi- we did finally, finally found kind of a longer term area of support down here. But, um, you know, their policy is completely different than everybody else's um, for good or for bad. And there it is. There's our area of support there at the bottom here. We kind of case we're hugging along that bottom here. We'll see if that stays or not. But this is a Japanese right. and U.S. dollar cross. And um, this is the one, you know, sovereign currency that where they said, hey, we're going to do something different. We're going to we're, we're actually gonna still buying securities. So and that blows me away that they're doing that and risking inflation. I think with Japan, they're talking about, you know, it's been decades of them trying to kick the deflation um, thing. And now they think this is their great opportunity to do so. And perhaps it is because they still don't have rampant inflation there like we do here, at least if we can believe the measures that I see. So I think it's fascinating that they're willing to just destroy the yen because politically, that would be bad. If that happened here where we destroyed the dollar and all of a sudden, and I know we're seeing rampant inflation, they did destroy the dollar, but it's still holding in pretty good against the euro and the yen. If all of a sudden that gave way to, I think people would be worried about their, uh, their phony baloney jobs, if you know what I mean. I think that's from, uh, from Blazing Saddles, right? Yes. Gentlemen, we have to protect our phony baloney jobs here, right? And I sometimes think about that when I look at the government. Yeah. A lot, a lot of our viewers won't remember Blazing Saddles, but I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> they should go and watch it immediately. Hey, Jim, could we go back to the micro tenure and the two year too? Because I, I think before I go, I, I would like to talk about like a longer term viewpoint, particularly on the tenure, because I am I'm curious as to um, what kind of support levels. If we're going to really start pushing tenure yields um, significantly lower there, can you get it? I see it's up on the upper right there. Can we get a little longer chart? Yes, sir. Because we're obvious at some ser- a serious level there, which is. Uh, what is that level of the two different lows in the 10 years? Is that 
All right, let me go to the tenure right now. I'm just going to get my crosshairs if I can find them. Right here, are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah that's two significant yeah, yeah. to me. Okay, yeah, yes, yeah. So what is about 2.78 to 2.8, right? So just the level we talked about when we talked about the trade. Because I think if we can knock through that, um, you know, from a technical standpoint, we, we don't have anything that I really see till about that 220 level where that that um, hump is back in uh, between February and March. Isn't that 220? The numbers are February, so small. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so you know, we have up a little higher. Yeah, right, there, so the top there. So there that to me seems significant. That's about 220. Was I right? Yep, yep, yep. So to me, it yep. seems like if we can crack through the two, let's call it 275 to be safe on the upside. I think we could easily head to that 220 level. And the, again, the fundamental story backs it up. If they're tightening into a recession, which to me seems crazy, which is, I know it's funny when people hear, because even a month ago, maybe even two months ago, I was talking about with Larry Kudlow about, oh, by and I do drop names, by the way, too. I'm not above that. About 100 base point, 100 base point move to get things in line which I should have done. I think they should have done that and front loaded it. But now the story's changed. Now the curve is, is suggesting that financial conditions are tight, not loose, and that things are slowing, if not already significantly slowed. Yeah, that, great observation and great technical analysis observation as well. You said you're about, what, 65% of the tech analysis side. I like it. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, no, look at the twos as well. So the twos it looks a lot different than the 10-year does. It doesn't share that same double bottom, but it does share, like if you go up a little higher than that, uh, the low there and the high there, uh, mm -hmm. down a little lower, significant right there. Yeah. So what level is that? That's uh, 284. Is that what it says? Yep. 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 So any movement below that level, I think in a close there could take us to that uh, low that your are the Jan, yeah, right. That low right there, which is that low right here. No. Yeah. Uh, for uh, about 250. 250, yeah. So I think a move below that 280 80 level takes 250 as well, which is interesting because I've been talking about how I think the Fed's going to tighten, going to tighten. But I think the market may uh, make the decision for them that they can't continue as uh, as aggressively as they anticipate. Yeah, very, I hear you, man. I like it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. We're going to keep our eyes on this. Remember, this is yield and we have an opposite relationship on prices. So if you're trading uh, the under, you know, the counterpart, right, the, the two year note, the 10 year note, the five year note, it's the opposite relationship. So keep that in mind mm -hmm. also. Right. No, and this is interesting stuff. Remember, these are, these are not normal times. And the volatility we're seeing in these instruments is kind of um, interesting as well. But the, the dynamic, changing landscape of the Federal Reserve is something I've never seen before. And I've been doing this for 35 years. I agree. Ditto. Me too. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you on the, on the time frame also. Um, but by the way, I do drop names too, but I just drop yours pretty much. You're the most famous guy I know. <laughs> and then sometimes Bobby's. <laughs> nice. I like that. Very good. Uh, do we oh, take questions God. now? Well, I think, I think we've covered, for all the questions that came in, I think we covered uh, pretty much covered everything just in the normal course of things, um, for sure. I do want to remind everybody how they can find you, though. You have a you have, you're really you're really active on Twitter, mm -hmm. and I like sure. good Twitter discussions too. And I get a lot from the people who follow me, uh, and it's very much a two way street. And that's at Jim Urio, J I M I U O R I O. And uh, if you have any specific questions that I can't answer, I'll just give you Bobby's cell phone number and you can just call him anytime you want. I'll put it out on Twitter for you. <laughs> I won't really. <laughs> That's a good idea. No, and this, and I, you know, I've been digging the Futures Edge podcast you and Bobby are doing with, yes, a lot of great special guests. I suggest everybody try to find that Futures Edge podcast and you'll get, a, you'll get uh, not only you and Bobby's point of view, but other folks' point of view as well. Yeah, we've had some really good guests so far and it's been uh, so much fun. And that comes out on Monday. We, we tape it on Friday afternoons. And we come out on Monday mornings, but uh, I think we're going to change that soon and have it available live, hopefully. But um, yeah, the, the guests on it have been fabulous. It's been really a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. And I do want to plug the CME Group's um, uh, Active Trader portion of their website. You could find if you just type in Google CME Group Active Trader, it's going to come up and you'll see a whole bunch of uh, really powerful, what I'm going to call recorded videos uh, from Jimmy, Bobby, and other folks. It's, uh, it's, I, listen, I, I go ahead and log in and listen to those things all the time. Right. And you can follow that. Um, they have a, a, a Twitter handle too, at CME Active Trader, that they release everything on Twitter as well, which is pretty good. 
Awesome. Active trader. Love it. All right. So uh, thank you so much for being here today. Our uh, time is up, uh, unfortunately, but we're going to be back at it again next week. Jimmy, thank you for being here. Thank you, Jim. See you. All right, guys. I do want to remind everybody too, uh, please, thank you for coming. Thank you for the hitting the thumbs up button on the YouTube channel. Greatly appreciate it. Remember, please be safe out there. Be good to each other. Thank you.